I know it's used to too much warmth, I guess. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Nancy Wells today to talk about health and nature and all kinds of the other good stuff. I'll give you a very brief overview of uh, how she got here in terms of her academic career. Um, you come full circle, right? You have been at Cornellian once before for an MS degree. Um, she got her uh, BA at, at Connecticut College uh, in New London, came to Cornell, went on to the University of Michigan, and uh, got her MS in architecture and a PhD in psychology and architecture. And I just tried to explore that Nancy <laughs> moment ago, what that means for you as a graduate student to try to do that. If you're interested in that, maybe a specific Michigan thing, Nancy can talk to you in detail about that. And she went up further west to uh, uh, University of California in Irvine as a postdoctoral trainee in the Department of Psychology and Social Behavior. Uh, and then she came back here in 2001, is that correct? Um, um, and has been here ever since. Um, is now an associate professor uh, in the di design and environment ana analysis uh, at, at Cornell, and she's also the director of graduate studies in between. I want to tell you a few little things about some of the uh, research grants that she has. She will tell you all about uh, uh, the work that she has done here in a, in a moment. Um, but among them are, it's a collaborative thing that's still going on. You didn't have any timeline. You're healthy gardens and healthy youth. Well, it's infinite. Uh, I don't it's, know. In, it's infinite, that's why there's no timeline to it. I, I was wondering about that. But it's a USDA grant that goes on forever, obviously, as you, as you said. So that's great. Great. Uh, the, the money says one million here, so if that goes on forever, it'd be very little per year, but I don't know. But she also has a grant from the MacArthur Foundation about housing matters, housing and neighborhood quality, children's mental health, and psychological stress. I don't know what part of that is in the presentation here. And then she has a grant together, some of you are familiar with, with, with uh, Janice Dickinson on the Yard Map Network. So that's my home, some of the highlights that are below. Yeah. Nancy? Take it away. Right. Thank, Thank you, you for coming out here. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone for coming today. So it's really a pleasure to be here in the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, I sort of have a warm spot for natural resources in my heart. When I was at Michigan, uh, I was doing this joint degree in psychology and architecture, but natural resources was kind of my third home where I did some coursework and even had a TA shift one semester. So I feel like you know, we're cousins or something. <laughs> so that's fun. Um, so thanks for coming today. I want to talk about children and nature. So Bern kind of alluded to the fact that some of my work is about the built environment, and I also actually do some work at different age groups, uh, older adults, and, and I'm sort of more motivated by the underlying question or the opportunity more so than a particular age group. So, um, but today I'll talk about, about children and nature. And what I hope to do is give you kind of an overview of some of the work in this area. I'll be talking about other folks' work as well as some of mine. Um, and then I'll, at the end, tell you some things that I'm doing right now, which are still sort of in the works that I, didn't, I don't have results yet to tell you about, but including this project that is consuming most of my life and seems to be endless, <laughs> the big school garden study. Okay, so um, children and nature, environments, environmental influences on health and well-being. I thought I would start by uh, talking a little bit about sort of the context for this work. Um, some of the sort of trends or phenomenon that we know about with respect to children today. So the first is that children spend relatively little free time outdoors. And you might think about your own childhood or uh, your parents' childhood, maybe if you know something about that, and think about how maybe that has shifted over time. So, um, children aged 3 to 12 spend about 27% of their time, about 13 hours a week, watching television. And actually, that's these data are a little bit old, and so it's, that number has increased in the last uh, decade. And only about 1% of their time, about half an hour a week, outdoors, engaged in unstructured activity. So, you know, that might strike you as not being a lot of time, maybe, depending how old you are and, and what your childhood is. Um, secondly, there's concern about a decline in ecological literacy. So children today seem to not know a lot about the world around us, the natural world around us, and I think that relates 
not only to trees and plants, but also to food, right? Like, where does food come from? And I saw a little clip of uh, Jamie Oliver. Did I tell about the, I don't have a TV, but I hear about these things. <laughs> Jamie Oliver, the British chef, came over to the United States, and he was down in the, in the southeast, eastern part of the US somewhere, um, talking with children and trying to inspire them to eat fruits and vegetables. And he brought in all these vegetables to the kids and showed them I mean, some of them were really common. I think he maybe a potato was one of them. Anyway, the kids had no idea what any of these things were. <laughs> None of them. And then he showed an eggplant, and he gave them the hint that the first word, was, the first part of the word was egg. And then the kids said egg salad. <laughs> anyway, so decline in ecological literacy. Uh, we're also concerned about environmental degradation. So on the one hand, we've made a lot of progress in over the decades in terms of clean air and clean water quality, but we still have a lot on our plate in terms of climate change issues and suburban sprawl and so forth. Um, and fourth is the prevalence of attention deficit disorder. So ADD affects about three to five percent of preschool and school children. This amounts to about two million children in the United States or thinking about it on the classroom level, one or two children in a typical classroom of about 20 or 25 kids. Um, and uh, lastly, fifth, uh, rising rates of overweight among children. So we hear lots in the media about childhood obesity. Uh, so here we see over time increases in uh, obesity. Uh, look at different age groups, you can think about some of us were kids, the rate of percentage was about 5 or 6 percent of children, and today it's up around, depending on the age group, around 15 or 18 percent. And I included this uh, Newsweek cover because I think it's a good reminder that we're not just concerned about childhood obesity because it's unfortunate to have kids that are overweight and all the struggles and difficulties of being an overweight child but also the idea of fat for life, the idea that these children are then set on a trajectory to be overweight adults and to have all of the many associated health, detrimental health outcomes associated with being overweight. So it's an you know, important and multifaceted issue. Um, and just briefly here, we see the data for boys um, looking across ethnic groups, uh, comparing the late 80s to mid 90s <coughs> to 2007, 2008. So we see increases in all these groups and similar patterns for girls, particularly high rates among uh, African Americans. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to suggest to you is that, you know, thinking about these uh, very fast factors that maybe to some extent there's a common denominator and maybe the sort of disconnection from the natural environment is relevant to all of these different themes. And this is part of what Richard Louvre has talked about in his book. I'm not sure if he touches on all of those themes, but the, the general idea that you know, there are lots of different trends that together seem to um, suggest that maybe nature has something to do with this or a disconnection from nature. Right? So are most of you familiar with Louvre? You've heard of, yeah, so the nature deficit disorder. So it's not a medical diagnosis, but it's this kind of bundling together of themes that relate to children's disconnection from nature. So uh, subsequent to the Lou book, there's been, I think, you know, he's really done a, a service to this area of kind of getting it on people's radar. So there have been various um, efforts kind of paying more attention to children nature issues, um, including the Children Nature Network, which is a useful uh, website, and some efforts by the U.S. Forest Service and others. And in many states, the Ch No Child Left Indoors movement, right, it's kind of a reaction to No Child Left Behind, you know, let, let's get kids outdoors. And the U.S. Forest Service had, um, has had some funding, which they called uh, more children in the woods or more kids in the woods, so kind of building on that idea. So um, I wanted to say a little bit about some of the work that has been done with respect to uh, linking the natural environment to physical health, just a couple studies that give a bit of background, and then I'll move on to talk about um, a variety of ways that nature seems to have beneficial effects for 
some of it's a little broader than children, but primarily on children. So uh, first is just a bit about physical health benefits. Um, so this is a little kind of a historical context. So maybe you're familiar with this um, study, the, the, the Roger Ulrich study in particular. This is kind of a classic study looking at views from the window from a hospital. So uh, this was using archival data, hospital data, of people who all had had gallbladder surgery. So everybody had the same kind of surgery. And some of the patients happened to have views of nature and some happened to have views of a brick wall. And so he wanted to see, uh, kind of replicated by the Verderver and, and Rubin study. We wanted to see what kinds of outcomes those folks had, depending on whether they had the, the natural view or the built view. And so he found that their stay in the hospital was shorter if they had a natural view. Um, they had fewer negative notes from the nurses. I think this wasn't uh, significant, but it's you know, in the predicted direction, if I remember right. Um, and in terms of pain dosage, we see a big difference, a significant difference. So requesting less um, pain medication. So this study, you know, kind of was, uh, it really is a, a seminal work and kind of got, uh, put nature on people's radar in terms of maybe making a difference in terms of health. A subsequent study looked at prison settings. So in this study, they looked at prisoners who had views from the exterior of the prison out to the farmlands and the rolling hills in comparison to the prisoners who had um, interior looking views into the courtyard, so less, less nature, less of an expansive view. And they found that those that had uh, natural views to the exterior had fewer visits to the infirmary than those with the interior view. So you might note that both of these studies are conducted in institutional settings where people don't have a lot of choice, right? Patients going into the hospital, they probably don't fill out a survey about what kind of view they want. And in prisons, I'm guessing they didn't have a lot of choice about where they did that. <laughs> so some of you know that I teach research methods. Some of you are my students. I've been my students. So I can't help but like, you know, weaving in a little research methods. Right? So in these institutional settings, we are doing a, a better job of dealing with self-selection because people don't have a lot of choice, right? We don't have the nature lovers or the ambivalent people. It's another condition. So these two studies kind of lay some foundation in terms of physical health. So now I'd like to move on and talk about specific studies um, about children and these four outcomes in terms of the influence of nature on health and well-being. So I'll talk about social and community well-being. I'll talk about cognitive functioning. And when I discuss cognitive functioning, I'll uh, have a little, a little tangent to tell you a bit about theory, the, the theory that underlies that. Uh, a bit about psychological well-being, and then lastly, environmentalism. I think the environmentalism piece is interesting in terms of um, kind of making this link of maybe how children are connected with the natural environment, how that might subsequently affect their commitment to the natural environment. So that's my plan. And again, I'll talk about my own work and, and others. Am I moving around too much for you, Joy? No, no. no. <laughs> Okay, so um, first in terms of social and community benefits, um, some uh, really classic work has been done in the city of Chicago within public housing in Robert Taylor Homes. So this was a natural experiment where um, it just happened over time that some of the public housing buildings, uh, maybe they originally had trees, but over time the trees were removed or they died, and around other public housing buildings they were thriving in. Five. So it was a nice opportunity to then compare these two settings. Right? So one of the strengths of the study is that the buildings are architecturally identical, and so we don't have that as an alternative explanation. Um, and so it also, again, helps to address this issue of self-selection. Right? Um, because they're architecturally identical and people in public housing don't have very much choice about where they end up. So the findings in this study um, include the idea that, I like to think of it as kind of um, nature is a social magnet, that nature kind of draws people together and facilitates social interaction. Um, so the first study found that the tree spaces were used more. So just kind of, you know, step one, okay, these, these spaces are used more, they're facilitating more social interaction, 
than the spaces where the trees have over time <coughs> died or been cut down. Uh, secondly, they found that the tree spaces facilitated children's play, right? So important from a developmental standpoint, and also intergenerational interaction. So more interaction with parents and with grandparents, which is developmentally important for children. They also then went on and, and uh, published some further studies from this uh, work looking at neighborhood social ties. So the idea of nature supporting positive communities. Uh, so here they found that the tree buildings supported uh, stronger social networks or neighborhood social ties. Uh, and this, there are actually two studies here, one among um, adult women and the, the Kuo study and the Kwan study was looking at older adults. And so this was like the, the, the social networks or social ties were things like, you know, do you, is there someone you can call on to watch your child if you need to run out for an errand for 20 minutes? Um, is there someone in your, in your building where, who, from whom you feel comfortable borrowing a cup of sugar or picking up the newspaper if you're out of town? Or, you know, those kinds of things. So that sort of social fabric or social network. And then other um, evidence suggested that in the tree, in the buildings with trees around them, there was less incidence of domestic violence. So perhaps, you know, there's something about maybe because of the social networks, we don't know exactly the mechanism, but people were able to find other, other strategies for dealing with conflict rather than slugging somebody, rather than domestic violence. Okay, and then in the, uh, under this caption of social and community benefits, uh, I'm including uh, this slide, which is um, this study, which looks at the question, can nature make us more caring? So this is a, a relatively recent study a few years ago where participants were immersed in nature. Um, those who were immersed in nature reported higher valuing of intrinsic aspirations. Uh, pro-social and other focus, so things that had to do with personal growth or intimacy, relationships, and community, and a lower valuing of extrinsic aspirations. Uh, so things that were more about themselves, money and image and fame and that sort of thing. So this study, I think, is um, it's a sort of a different sort of theoretical arena, but I thought it was interesting under this caption of sort of social and community benefits. Is there something about the natural environment that and it's still more community values or altruism. Okay, next I'd like to turn to the second dependent variable, concentration and cognitive benefits. So one of the early studies in this area was conducted by um, Tennyson and Simpridge within a dormitory. This is a University of Michigan, I think, study, um, where they looked at the views that college students had from their dormitory rooms, whether they had views that were predominantly natural, trees and grass, or, or predominantly built, so uh, buildings and cars and roads. And they found that the students that had more natural views performed better on a cognitive task. And so these uh, cognitive tasks are typically like a proofreading task, something that requires sort of focus and attention to identify errors and, and detail, that sort of thing. So this was one of the relatively early studies in that area. Other work has been done um, looking at, uh, this study looked at backpackers, and they had the backpackers uh, go on vacation. So the, they were all backpackers to start with, someone on a backpacking vacation, someone on an urban vacation, and some of them stayed home. That was sad for them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So they found that the, the folks that had the backpacking vacation improved or showed better cognitive functioning than the other groups. Uh, I think the urban and the stay home groups were about the same. And then uh, I think this is interesting. This is kind of a complementary study looking at uh, just a 40 minute break. So randomly assigning people to go on a 40 minute natural walk, a 40 minute urban walk, or 40 minutes kind of quietly resting indoors. So this is kind of the little um, micro analog to the other study, right? So, and also a reminder that uh, the benefits of nature aren't something that we just write into our calendar once a year, but we can think about them on a daily basis. So they found 
parallel findings that the folks that went on the natural walk performed better on these cognitive tasks than the other groups. A study in Sweden um, looked at uh, a daycare program, Utipodagis, which means outdoors for daycare. Do we have any Swedish speakers? <laughs> then you won't know if I don't pronounce it right. That's good. <laughs> um, so they looked at this Utipodagis program where the kids were outdoors all day and compared that to a more traditional indoor daycare program. Um, and they found that the, the kids concentrated better, so consistent with these other findings we've talked about. They also showed that they had uh, better motor skills than the kids in the indoor program. But I think these pictures are great. So here these kids are standing on the little logs and going up to the window for snack time. So they don't have to take off all their layers and go inside. They just have to go to the window. Stay all bundled up. OK, so now um, here's my little, um, little tangent about theory. I wanted to share with you a little bit about the theoretical underpinnings of the the work in terms of cognitive restoration and cognitive functioning. So attention restoration theory was developed by Stephen Kaplan and Rachel Kaplan at the University of Michigan. And the theory is really based on the work of William James, the early American psychologist, who said that, posited that we have two kinds of attention. Directed attention, well he called them um, voluntary attention, and involuntary attention. So voluntary attention, which is now been renamed as directed attention require, requires effort. So that's what we're all using to do our taxes about this time of year. <laughs> so we have to focus and concentrate. Um, in contrast, involuntary attention is captured effortlessly. It's very easy and doesn't, doesn't require effort. <laughs> so that was, that's the sort of foundation of the work based on William James's early ideas. Um, so the idea then is that directed attention fatigue occurs after we used the effortful attention, directed attention, for prolonged periods without sufficient rest, without sufficient exposure to nature or views of nature, that sort of thing. And um, I don't know if around this time of the, of the semester if you, any of these symptoms sound familiar, but the uh, directed attention fatigue is characterized by distractibility, difficulty concentrating, and even irritability. So I can write you a prescription if that sounds familiar to you. Yeah. So the idea is that um, the natural environment restores attentional capacity, and it does that um, by engaging uh, involuntary attention, the easy, effortless attention and allowing directed attention, the effortful attention, to rest and recover. So that's the, that's the short version of basically what this theory suggests. And there are four properties of nature that underlie that, that recovery, that foster recovery. So the four properties are fascination, which is really another way of saying that nature captures the involuntary attention. <coughs> So fascination is another, another name for involuntary attention. So it captures attention effortlessly and allows the directed attention, the <coughs> effortful attention to rest. The second characteristic is that nature gives us a sense of being away, a sort of mini vacation from our daily concerns, our immediate concerns. And I think it's um, good to note that that doesn't necessarily I guess back to the sort of vacation idea, it doesn't mean necessarily always literally being away, but we can have a sort of mini vacation or a micro vacation even from having a natural view from our window. Right? So it doesn't always, it's not all about packing your bags, but those sort of micro, micro breaks that allow for uh, an intermission from <coughs> daily concerns. Um, third is extent. This is the idea that nature um, and a natural environment has a certain amount of depth, so we can become kind of immersed or engaged in that setting, or in that view, as the case may be. And fourth is the idea of compatibility, that nature allows for a match between <coughs> a person's purposes or inclinations and what the environment provides or facilitates, kind of this idea of affordances. And I think of the four, that's, to me, the compatibility is um, 
the fuzziest, you know, sort of the, the hardest to kind of wrap your head around. And um, Rachel Kaplan, in some of her writing, talked about the idea of compatibility as being a sense of having the wind at your back. I think that's a helpful way of thinking about it. You know, the idea that the environment is facilitating what you want to do, rather than giving you a headwind, that, um, that's a barrier and a hurdle. Okay, so now uh, to continue on with uh, concentration and cognitive benefits, and focus a little bit more specifically on children, a study that I did, this was actually part of my dissertation work, looked at um, yeah. increases in nearby nature when children move, this was part of a work that I did with Habitat for Humanity. So the finding was that um, when children move to places with more nearby nature, we see improvements in cognitive functioning. And those improvements are explained by the increases in, in nature. And they're not explained by the improvements in housing quality, which I think you know, would be an obvious alternative explanation. Um, so some of the work from the folks at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, who did the Chicago study that I described to you, uh, has looked at attention deficit disorder. So they've uh, done a series of studies that suggest that activities in green spaces lower the symptoms of children with attention deficit disorder. So their studies have included surveys of parents, um, and then more recently they conducted a randomized controlled trial um, or a true experiment to randomly assign children to have a, a, take a nature walk, a neighborhood walk, or a downtown walk. Um, again, specifically children with attention deficit disorder, and they found um, that the nature walk did reduce symptoms. So I should say um, the notion here is that the symptoms that we all experience, and to some extent the underlying physiology of directed attention fatigue, that like any of us, all of us might experience, is analogous to attention deficit disorder. Right? So that's the underlying logic, that there are some similarities physiologically and behaviorally, and so that's, that's what sort of led them then to look at this idea of attention deficit disorder and how it might be affected by nature. Okay, so now I want to turn to the third dependent variable that I mentioned, psychological well-being, and tell you a little bit about a study um, that I did with my colleague Gary Evans. So it's well established in the psychology literature that, not surprisingly, stress and adversity has a negative effect on psychological well-being. And what we were interested in was the idea that maybe exposure to or access to the natural environment might buffer that linkage, might uh, moderate that relationship. So could nature attenuate the impact of stress or adversity? So in this study, we uh, measured stress and adversity um, using a um, significant, uh, sorry, a life stress inventory. Uh, so analogous, maybe you've seen the adult version of that kind of instrument. So there's also a child version, and it asks questions not only about, like, have you moved in the last year, or has your grandmother died, um, but are you subject to peer pressure, are you picked on at school, do your parents fight a lot, that kind of thing. So that was our measure of our independent variable, stress and adversity. And then we looked at um, psychological well-being was measured uh, by a sort of global self-worth measure among the children, or sorry, psychological well-being, uh, we actually measured it in two different ways. This was a measure that the kids completed. We also had one by the moms. Um, and then nature, we looked at what was nearby their home. So this was sort of nearby nature. In what was the material of the yard? Was it dirt? Was it grass? Um, and sort of what were the views from the window? How natural was that immediate nearby area? So we found that and here I'm actually using, um, not to hopefully confuse you, but psychological distress. So in other words, uh, higher numbers mean more distress, not more well-being. So it's sort of the inverse of psychological well-being. Um, so we see uh, clearly an effect of stressful life events, low, medium, high. And we see the, the buffering of um, low nature, um, have, kids have consistently higher levels of psychological distress, right? And what I think is striking here is we see the sort of the moderating, the dampening is particularly substantial 
among the kids exposed to the highest level of stressful life events, right? We see the greatest difference here as opposed to in the other groups. So this study suggests that nature does buffer the impact of stress on children. Uh, again, as I mentioned, particularly among the most vulnerable kids. And I think it's noteworthy that these tests are pretty conservative. This was actually conducted with um, kids in a fairly rural setting, upstate New York. Um, so not just Ithaca, but the surrounding area. So I think we might hypothesize to see stronger effects if we collected similar data in our urban context. So I wanted to mention some future research with respect to that study in particular. And I think uh, one question that's interesting to me is what's the mechanism that underlies the buffering? Right? So I could call on some of my students to to articulate that in terms of mediators and moderators, but I'll spare them. So that would be, uh, so if nature has a moderating effect on this association, what's the mediator? What's the explanation that explains that interaction? So from the literature that I've talked about already, we have some candidates, right? It could be social support, the kids that have more nature nearby, have, um, more playmates and social support in the neighborhood, could be that. Uh, it could have to do with cognitive functioning, right? It could be that the kids with more nature access are able to think more clearly and cope more effectively with their problems. So that might explain it. Uh, or it could have to do with physical activity, which is something we haven't really talked about either. And uh, some folks have started to look at kind of interactive effects of cognitive restoration and physical activity, so nature and physical activity together. Okay, and then uh, lastly, I want to say a bit about environmentalism um, and this idea of kind of linking childhood experiences with nature with later life commitment to environmentalism. So the inspiration for this study, which I did with my colleague Christy Lakeys, who is now at Ohio State University, was that uh, there had been relatively little work in this area uh, looking at the general population. So, um, there's the significant life events literature looks at um, folks who have kind of made a career in um, environmental issues, but doesn't really look at the general population. And uh, there haven't really been a lot of studies that have tried to look over the long term, sort of looking over decades at you know, how did what happened when you were 12 might be associated with, with later life outcomes. So that was part of the idea as well. So we used data here that was collected by Virginia Moore and uh, her colleagues. Um, it was funded through a NUCFAC. Um, do you guys know NUCFAC? The Na uh, National Urban and Community Forestry Advisory Council. And so there's sort of a data sharing requirement, and so their way of addressing that was like, oh, it, people can use their data, or there's some kind of sharing component, so that's what they did. So our findings here um, suggested that participation in what we call wild nature, which was like camping and hunting and fishing, um, as well as participation in with domesticated nature, which was things like uh, planting seeds and taking care of a tree, or a pet, having a pet maybe was included in that that they both seem to have linkages with environmental attitudes in adulthood, and then that both uh, mediates and there's direct effects to pro-environment behaviors, looking at both attitudes and behavior in adulthood. So there seem to be some linkages there. Um, and we, we didn't find in this study strong effects with environmental ed or time in nature with others. But I think sort of a, a really appropriate caveat for this study is, you know, the way that some of these variables were operationalized probably was, you know, one of the challenges with secondary data it might not be exactly what you would have put together if you collected the data yourself. And so, you know, I think that was, um, there might be other ways to measure it. And uh, another kind of challenge with this is the whole idea of self-report, you know, interviewing people when they're 30 and 40 and 50 about what happened which is kind of one of my real criticisms of the significant life events it, um, research, the which I mentioned, sig yeah, significant life events research that's been done with the environmental professionals. 
So the good news in our study is that we weren't asking people so much to, well, good news given what we were trying to achieve, we weren't asking them to make linkages between their childhood events and later life attitudes. I mean, that, we just asked them what happened in your childhood and what do you believe now? And that was along with a whole bunch of other questions. And so then the statistical analysis determined the association. So it's a little different approach than interviewing someone and asking them how, would, how did their childhood activities influence labor life. Does that make sense? Okay, so a few um, implications or conclusions and then, uh, then I wanted to just show you a couple slides about my current work so you know what's, what's cooking. Um, so perhaps I have convinced you, although I'm preaching to the choir here, that nearby nature is not merely an amenity or a nicety, but it's really essential to children's healthy functioning. And I think, um, you know, we may all know that, we might believe it, but I think it's striking how often, you know, in a, in a public housing development or in various kinds of efforts where, you know, the money runs short and then the, the natural environment is neglected and it's just all about the built environment. And, and so I think getting that on the radar is important. Um, another take home message I hope is that an effective dose of nature doesn't necessarily need to be great or lengthy. The idea of you know, a view from your window or the, the routes that you choose on campus to get from A and B can sort of contribute to your, your daily dose, uh, what some uh, European researchers call vitamin G. So your, your vitamin green for the day. <laughs> Um, to foster children's social, cognitive, and psychological well-being, opportunities to engage with nature should be prevalent across settings. So I think thinking about, you know, not just in the in schools, but at home and in, within the community, that we need to have opportunities for kids to be in nature. Um, and lastly, this kind of linkage that we've begun to explore with environmentalism suggests that providing children with these kinds of opportunities might be an investment in the planet as well, uh, given that increasing may increase likelihood <coughs> that today's youth will be the stewards of the environment for tomorrow. So, I could pause there, or I could tell you about what's next. <laughs> I knew this was going to be awkward. <laughs> What are you doing now? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Okay, so one of the studies I'm working on right now is looking at older dolls, so totally the other end of the spectrum, and the notion that the natural environment might um, buffer the linkage between pain catastrophizing and the experience of pain. So how many of you have heard of Henny Kenny? Oh, good, that's not so bad. So I just like on a whim did a Google image search for pain catastrophizing and Henny Penny came up. <laughs> <laughs> so Henny, the sky is falling, chicken little. So uh, not really about pain, but catastrophizing in any case. So there's um, significant work um, suggesting that pain catastrophizing, the idea of sort of exaggerating the, the pain or the implications of pain can can lead to a greater experience of pain, and with post-operative patients can uh, possibly lead, lead to chronic pain. So rather than just you know, short-term post-operative pain, can result in long-term chronic pain. And so there's quite a bit of focus now on, on this idea of pain catastrophizing. And so we're wondering if maybe um, access to nature views of nature might buffer that linkage, so thereby reducing the experience of pain. So that's one thing that we're cooking up. And then the other thing, which I mentioned before, the, the big oh, consuming my life thing, is um, this study of school gardens. So this is a study that's funded by the USDA. Um, we also have funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to look at physical activity. So one of the things that I think is really compelling about gardens is the potential to affect both sides of the energy balance equation, thinking about childhood obesity. So potentially uh, influencing, increasing the amounts of fruits and vegetables that kids eat, and maybe encouraging them to be more physically active. 
getting out and learning your math in the garden by using a tape measure and figuring out what the dimensions of the garden should be and counting seeds is probably more active than sitting in a chair and learning math in the classroom. Um, so that's what we're working on. And one of the things we're doing with this project is taking photographs of the kids' lunches. So as they leave the lunch line, we get an image, and then after they're done eating, we get another image, then we'll figure out what that minus that builds. <laughs> with like 18,000 images, so we're having a great time. Thank you. <laughs> like there's been a movement away from uh, focusing play areas around natural materials, around um, having trees as climbing trees. If you go back 30 years ago, yeah. that was a big movement. And now those play areas are focused around plastic play structures because they're safer um, in theory. So um, if it's just physical activity, maybe there isn't any difference between those two. Mm -hmm. But if there's some element of the, the interaction with natural materials, mm -hmm. um, or if, even if these are kind of, they just replicate what a tree might look like, or <laughs> built of, of yeah. wood. I, you know, I, I just wonder if that's been a movement away from um, incorporating some of the effects that you're talking about in terms of their, their relationship with uh, the perception of nature. Yeah, I think that the pendulum is swinging back some, at least. I think there's more, or maybe I'm in this weird little sphere that that's what I see and hear, but um, you know, more attention to having somewhat more natural landscapes and maybe less pavement and more, even if it's lawn, you know, not really. I know the idea of what's natural is a good question. Um, so I think that we're making progress, but one of the big hurdles is, like you said, what's safe, right? So there's a lot of liability concerns. I know some landscape architects that focus on um, environments for kids, and you know, just wanting to have like a big boulder that kids can climb on is, you know, something that they'd like to do. And there's all this worry, like it's so a kid couldn't hit their head on it, you know. So, so I, I'm half encouraging that we're swinging back a little bit, but there's definitely challenges still. Liability. So you would say that there is, in, in the best of all possible worlds, you'd rather have natural materials as part of that structure. It's not just physical activity as far as your, your Yeah, I would say goes. so. I mean, I don't think we know for sure whether, like if the, if the play area is surrounded by trees and they have views of trees, like exactly how that would differ in benefits from if they're actually climbing the trees. But I think, yeah, having more incorporation of of natural elements. I don't even know, do kids climb trees still? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I keep hearing that like, they're not allowed. That's the reason I mean, they're not, in some schools, they're not allowed to play tag anymore. Because they might get hurt, you know, so, yeah. So I think that's interesting, because, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was thorough and it was the grounding. We are just doing something similar. Actually, the similarity comes out of unintentionally. We were asking children about science and engineering in their community. Mm -hmm. And they decided to define science and engineering with reference to what you would call nature. Mm -hmm. So they would define science occurring in nature mm -hmm. as well as a their goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would describe engineering occurring in in that process, we discovered that they're actually not situating themselves outside of their environment. So they're always part of nature. Oh. So they're actually, in their minds, not separating. Mm -hmm. And how do we know that? Because we ask them to take photographs. Okay. So, and then we ask them to explain their photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, and through that, we were able to follow how they're reasoning through this. Mm -hmm. So this is grade two to six, and the only data we're analyzing is So it's, it's going, it's sort of, it's um, contradicting the nature deficits, I think, saying that, you know, maybe there is not a deficit. Uh, which kids are these? These are kids in uh, upstate New 
are assumed to be poor or middle to poor schools in that state. We can't get the names of the school. So it's interesting that where, where there are deficits perceived legally, this deficit doesn't seem to exist in terms of how sick kids situate themselves within their environment. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're making connections to their curriculum in terms of simple machines and engineering. And so mm -hmm. But the, this raises the point where you just stopped. So that's the first question. The second part is that we're, and we haven't finished analyzing, so we're still there. Uh, which raises the question about the parents, you know, tag. Because, you know, those of us who have kids know that if any playground has metal on it, and you can bang your head and you can hurt yourself, whether it's a boulder or it's something you built. Uh, so I wonder to what degree is the deficit being defined by our questions? You see what I mean? Because we have these helicopter parents going around. I think that's the term we use. But it's an appropriate term. Uh, going around, even here at this little daycare we had at Uh And so, uh, so our Cornell defines why. I and mean, you can see when you go for a walk around every day on a tangent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I call it wildlife, right? right. But not crossing the road. That's <laughs> safe. Um, so I wonder if uh, the really that the actual deficit occurs in the parents who are organizing the research question. You know what I'm saying? In the survey. I wonder to that, to what extent is that element coming through? And I'm not asking this as a criticism, yeah. but just as to what degree are we imposing the deficit or creating the deficit? Oh, I see. Like, where is it coming from? Yeah. What's the reason for I think that's right. I mean, I think there's. And part of it is that of kids being more scheduled and more on sort of tight time frames, you know, got to go do the piano and then go to soccer practice and sort of this drive to have these super kids that are multifaceted and awesome candidates for Ivy League institutions. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, I think it is partly driven by parents and by our culture. You know, what that values have shifted and we sort of lost trash. So I'm making the leap and say, what about our research? Is that also mm -hmm. the, the, the perspective of the research paradigm mm -hmm. of seeing the disorder, the deficit? Right. I don't know. I guess I, my sense is that if we look at the trends and the symptoms, and we see that there are established linkages, that nature could benefit those things, and the lack of nature could yeah. contribute to those negative things. Um, I mean, that seems pretty compelling. I think, I mean, I guess we should be a little cautious about nature deficit disorder. I think sometimes we don't want it to sound like a medical diagnosis. You know, really it's just sort of like this bundle of trends. Is that not a little bit? Yeah. And then I think the question of your first question about, you know, what kids define as nature and is there really nature deficit? I, I guess one thought I have about that is maybe deciding for you as researchers what is and isn't nature and, and sort of looking at it. I mean, if they're saying their home is natural, like even indoors, I would think about what frame you'd want to put on it, even if they're defining it that way, so that you can compare in indoors versus outdoors at least, or something that makes a, a distinction. So just for example, just for, uh, is that for example, a child sees the fossils, the fossil remains that are in the rocks right outside the door mm. as part of the habitat uh, see. that they occupy. Right. Or the creek as part of their habitat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which they fish. Yeah. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> I'm glad some that some kids make stuff. Right here in the middle of the tree. <laughs> so, right. so I want to open this can of worms of what constitutes nature, um, because everything that you reflected on, if I look into the conservation literature, and there's just a, a couple of rather interesting pieces in the last issue, in the February issue of Conservation Biology, of what category we reject anything that you have shown here as being part of nature for many different reasons, and I consider it to be absolutely faulty. Yeah. Um, but 
nevertheless, if you talk and try to bring conservation folks together with folks that do architecture or uh, you know psychology, and so when you are creating there are artifacts of human behavior that doesn't constitute nature, by that we disenfranchising all those little people there in us, right? So any experience that we can have that's close to home, the way that you describe it, Kareem, is not nature, right? So nature is out there somewhere we don't know. Um, so what what is it? Um, what constitutes nature as it is self-identified or recognized? Yeah. Because the, the things that you measure are real, right? Less pain medication, fewer days in a hospital, that's not some have it's that's pretty clear that you have an effect. Mm -hmm. However, it's the it's it's materialized. Mm -hmm. I assume if you would have a picture of trees and something else outside your window, so it's glued over. Right. Did anybody ever do that as an effect? <laughs> so you fake it. Right. You still look at it. Um, so what would that make a difference? Are there things like that? Yeah. You... Well, people have started to look at that, uh, like a screen of nature rather than actual nature. Right. It doesn't seem to have as much effect as the real thing. But I think one way to try to get at the question you're raising would be to think of the natural environment more on a continuum rather than built versus natural, to think about sort of degrees of nature. I mean, it's more kind of getting at one angle of the dose-response question. So to what extent do those increments um, matter from if we, does that make sense to everybody? So like if we start with like a really built environment to, I don't know, an uncut forest or something, would that be sort of the extreme? You know, trying to um, operationalize different categories within that, and I mean, that would be one. So one. One question that I had with that was part of the structural complexity. If you think you're looking at forest, even into a garden, there are many dimensions. There's movement probably with wind or something else. Very different than when you would have, I mean, a sweet sea, but maybe <laughs> <laughs> to fit, fit fish swimming through that or trees waving or so. Uh, so you could get close to that, but there's a different way that your eyes interact with what, what is happening outside, the depth that you can have, close views, distant views. Well, when you look at a wall, that's the distance that you can view, mm -hmm. right? So you can move closer and see maybe how a brick is made of or what Keep what looks like close up, but it's still pretty clear what you're looking at. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing that you can, uh, your eye can go back and forth. People ever experiment with that? What, what, what it is looking into? Yeah, I don't think people have really. I mean, one of the really remain. There's various aspects of this dose response question that are still up in the air, which I think relates to your question. Um, and I think it is mostly pretty up in the air. So you know, the idea of like even a view of nature as opposed to actually sitting in it. We're not really going to quite figure that out. So, and the move, I mean, the actual sort of parsing apart, you know, water is an element that seems to kind of resonate for people, but water and movement and lots of research with you guys looking for feces or something. <laughs> yeah, the back. Um, I don't know if I have so much of a question, just I was wondering if you were even aware of uh, there's a whole bunch of primitive skills schools around this country now that stem off of people such as Tom Brown and John Young, mm -hmm. who have a great book called The Coyote's Guide, and that's reconnecting children and adults through nature through like a Socratic sort of format of questioning and leading them to find their own um, conclusions. When you're talking about nature and what it is, I think it's certainly situational. If you're talking about kids in the urban environment, if you get a rooftop garden, if you can show them weeds coming out of the concrete, that's awesome. If you're privileged enough to be around here, there's people not only looking at trees, but knowing what those trees are good for, what medicine you can make from them, how you can use pine needles, how you make shelter. I think there's certainly a lot of different levels, and being someone who's been diagnosed as ADD my entire life, and I can tell you first and foremost that it is certainly NDD, a nature deficit disorder, that it's... It, and my mother's done a lot to do a paradigm shift on ADD because a disorder, d describing it as a disorder in any sense is putting kind of a negative connotation to something that really is a gift and a, 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 a true symbol of, or uh, not a symbol, but just a, a great avenue for leadership, I think. And so I don't know what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm actually trying to say, but I think that just any exposure that you can get kids to, you get, you get a positive response. And I, I find it so funny that in this society, in this paradigm that we have to even do research and have theses to like explain the how how fruitful and health beneficial not being under you know 
these UV lights are and being indoors. And, and in terms of um, any studies on looking in the distance or not, uh, one of the core routines of these primitive seal schools is something called owl eyes, where you can see your hands out here and up here. And when you walk in nature like that, so you're more observant and turning around, not just so myopic, mm -hmm. um, it puts you what, what they call like alpha. It actually, they've studied that it changes like the, the brain waves and, and well, the level that you're thinking and functioning at, mm -hmm. right? And so there's, there's a lot to it, definitely. Yeah. So. Thanks for your comments. Yeah. And, um, one of the great uh, outdoor programs is Primitive Pursuit, so local group based here in Tompkins County and Carpenter Extension, they do that. So wilderness based on Tom Brown and the others. Thanks. Jennifer? I was thinking about another angle on the kind of natural experiment, and that's, you know, in, in urban environments, some cities have long linear parks, mm -hmm. sometimes built around water, mm -hmm. that are relatively well used and easily accessible. Other cities have parks that are, you know, less well used and easily accessible, and they're kind of two, two angles on use and accessibility. One mm -hmm. is the sort of is it physically possible for lots of people to get there and play? Right, right. The other is, is it perceived as safe to do so? Right, right. And I wonder if anybody is actually looking at that kind of embedded nature in cities and the impact on, on children's health and elders' health. Mm. There has been a fair um, bit of work on parks and urban settings, um, both in terms, there's a, a nice study done in Japan a few years ago that showed that they looked at where the folks were built, uh, born, but older adults like in their 70s and 80s and looked at their five-year survivorship. One of the greatest predictors of that was whether they had a tree-lined street approximate to their apartment or their home. Um, so that's just one example. Um, and there's certainly work on you know, perceived safety issues and how that can, can be a barrier. So. And I think some sort of city planning and design to, you know, issues looking forward is, you know, could to kind of benefit from this kind of research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, Marianne. Um, on the Kaplan and Kaplan's nature restoration, what's the full name of it? Sorry. Attention restoration theory. Attention restoration theory? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so they're proposing a mechanism to explain some of the observed um, results, but has anybody really researched how valid that mechanism is? They're proposing the sort of four yeah, there have been some. There has been some work in that direction to sort of look at. I think um, is it maybe Berto? <coughs> Starts with a B. Um, starting to do some like MRI scan, you know, brain scan kind of work to try to look at what's actually happening physiologically mm -hmm. in the brain to sort of corroborate this theory that hasn't, you know, most of the work historically hasn't looked in the brain. And now that we're more and more able to do that, that's helping to understand more clearly and seems to corroborate what the theory is suggesting. So we're getting closer. The four, I mean, because those four things, um, maybe with the exception of the last, the same is true if you watch a video, you know, it's engaging, you're resting from, the from yeah. really paying attention. And right. So, I mean, I, you know, I keep seeing that theory referred to, but I've never really seen anybody test it. Okay, so that part of it. I guess I was thinking more about what happens in the brain. Mm -hmm. In terms of the four components, um, I don't know if that being like really tested out, you know, I think that's kind of a hypothesis in terms of exactly how they work, how those four pieces work. But you make a good point about other kinds of stimuli, and um, so I didn't really get into this, but um, the theory would say that the natural environment is a form of soft fascination. So it engages involuntary attention in a sort of gentle way and allows directed attention to rest. In contrast to that, we have hard fascination, which like grabs your attention, right? Like the, when the bear comes charging at you or when the fire engine goes uh, screaming down the road or lots of what we see on television is also in that form. And so, so that's kind of a distinction where like it's more you know, these, you know, very evolutionarily based survival kinds of mechanisms are called to play because you're in survival mode. And so that's another piece of involuntary attention that we don't want too much of that because that's not helpful and restorative. So does that help a little? Um, I, I, you know, it's almost a critique in that that was proposed in 1980, like, Kaplan and Kaplan mm -hmm. proposed that, and they produced you know, wonderful, wonderful students from the University of Michigan, from, from the people in this field, like I, I think yourself and, and Paul and so forth, but it seems like the theory hasn't really been addressed. 
-hmm. I think there are different pieces of it. I mean, the part, like the components of nature, the four components haven't been, I don't know that that's really been tested out really thoroughly. But I think we're, I mean, to my mind, I guess, I guess the, the brain part of it and the physiology part of it, in some ways, I guess I would almost argue is more important, but I guess it just depends what your priorities are and where your interests are. You know, more so than teasing apart what are the piece, what are the actual aspects of nature so that are directed or non directed attention thought really exists, that's the kind of thing you can tell with the brain. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That's I mean, it almost seems like there needs to be a third category of captured attention. You know, rather than involuntary. Oh, the, you know, the sense, right, it's the, what they call hard, hard right, involuntary right, right, attention. Yeah. So it's sort of a sub involuntary attention that's two types, soft and hard. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, guys.